Hello, this is I Miss Christendom. I'm doing this sort of off the cuff. I don't really have a script, so bear with me. There may be some long pauses, some ums, and maybe even a little bit of stuttering. This is about how to handle Protestants. Now, if you're Catholic and you live in the United States and you have friends, family, co-workers who aren't Catholic, undoubtedly you've been challenged about what Catholics believe. And unfortunately, a lot of Catholics don't know what to say or what to do. And unfortunately, sometimes this turns into them leaving the Catholic Church because they don't know their faith. And that's the church's fault. And we'll get into that into another video. But I wanted to just kind of go over some rules that I personally have in dealing with Protestants. And I've developed this over many years. And so I'm going to go into my background a little bit so you have a better understanding of where I'm coming from. I was not raised Catholic. I was raised Protestant, particularly uh, Presbyterian. And I have a little bit of a different story than a lot of more famous Protestant converts who come over here. Usually this story goes, they were very anti-Catholic. They set out to disprove Catholicism. They started looking into history, reading the early church fathers, reading the Bible and all this. And then at the end of the day, they came to the unsettling conclusion that the Catholic Church is everything that it says it is. Well, that's not my story. My story is a little bit different in that I became Catholic, then I was challenged by all my Protestant friends and co-workers and family and had to look into this stuff. And over 20-some years, I've gained a lot of knowledge. I don't, I don't have a degree or anything like that. I've come to the knowledge that I'm giving to you based on my own research, just out of necessity. In fact, I went to college for a hotel restaurant management degree, and I dropped out in my junior year and married my girlfriend, and we had children, and we started a family. There probably hasn't been a Catholic before me, my mother, my father, and my sister when we converted in the 90s since the Reformation. In fact, I, doing research on my family through Ancestry.com, I found out I am a direct descendant of Daniel Perrin, or Daniel the Huguenot which I thought was, which I think is kind of ironic. He's probably rolling over in his grave right now. I live in Springfield, Missouri, which is heavily Protestant, particularly evangelical Protestant. It's 80% evangelical Protestant. The Assemblies of God headquarters, International World Headquarters, is here. So a good portion of the people who live in this area are Assemblies of God, and the rest, most of them are Southern Baptist. That makes up 80%. And then the other 20% is divided among all the other denominations with 3% being Catholic. So I've always been constantly challenged about my faith because I'm always friends with these people. I'm a friendly person. I like people, especially other Christians. I don't judge normally. And eventually this comes up and I've had to, had to look into all this stuff, particularly with my mother-in-law. Now, the first when I talked about that I dropped out of college, we actually ended up getting divorced. Uh, we, I did get a, an annulment, and then I married my wife, which we've been married for over 20 years, 23 years, I think, to be exact. And her mother is very anti-Catholic and has tried, she tried probably the first five years to convert me away from Catholicism. And this is really where this all kind of started with me because I had to start looking into this and everything. So I've de developed a few rules on how to deal with Protestants. Now, I don't want to take complete credit for these rules. A lot of them I learned along the way from other Catholic sources, such as Catholic Answers, which is a great source to, to, to go to when these people come at you, and uh, Church Militant and other places. So here are the rules. First rule is no drive-bys, okay? So if someone comes up to you and says, how come you guys think that the, the Pope is Christ on earth? And why do you re-sacrifice Jesus in the Mass? And why do you worship Mary? And how come you confess your sins to a priest? Well, that's a lot. And so what you do is you say, well, those are really good questions. Let's take those one at a time. Which one would you like to, to go over first? You don't allow them to just throw a bunch of stuff at you. We deal with these things one at a time. And so that's rule number one. And by the way, you're going to find in dealing with Protestants, the Protestants fall into one of three categories. The first category is those who don't care. 
They don't care about that you're Catholic. They don't care about Catholicism. They're only interested in dealing with their own faith. Now, if you become real good friends, they might ask you some questions later on down the road. But typically, you know, you don't really deal with these people. The second one are the people who are genuinely interested in what is it that you guys believe? How, how come you guys believe this or whatever? Those are the best to deal with. Unfortunately, you're more than likely going to deal with the third type. And that's the type that no matter what you say, they're just anti-Catholic. They're trying to get you over to their church and you can explain till the cows come home what the Catholic church believes. They're not going to believe it because their goal is to get you out of the Catholic church and into their church because Protestants have this weird idea that that you get a higher place in heaven, you get rewards in heaven by how many people you bring over to your church. So it's kind of almost this multi-level marketing thing. It's really strange. So the second rule is the Catholic church gets to determine what Catholics believe. Okay. Pastor Bob doesn't get to decide it. Jack T. Chick doesn't get to decide it. No one but the Catholic church gets to decide what Catholic doctrine means. And you insist on this. So in other words, when they say, well, you guys believe that the Pope is Christ on earth, and you say, no, we don't, and they say, well, my pastor said you do. Well, pastor's wrong, and you insist on that. You say, this is what the Catholic Church believes, and that is it. That's the end of it. They don't have a right to their opinion on it. There's not an opinion on what Catholic doctrine means. It means what the Catholic Church says it means. Rule number three, and this goes along with rule number one, you have the right to look it up and get back to them. Okay. Most people are not Catholic scholars and sometimes they don't really know. And the fact is they don't know why they believe either. But if they say, well, what does it mean? What do you mean when you say Mary is immaculate conception? You know, you say, you know, I, I I think it's this, but I want to, let me look that up and get back to you. You have the right to do that. And a really good source to get quick information is Catholic answers. They have a website, but they also have a lot of videos on YouTube. You can just go to YouTube and say Catholic Answers and then type in whatever it is you need to look up. It'll come up with a bunch of probably five to six or seven minute clips just giving quick answers on this stuff. And make sure that you write down the Bible verses, chapter, you know, the book, chapter, and verse, because that's what they're going to go for. And and try as as much as you can to give scriptural support because that's the only thing that they're really going to uh, accept. Next rule, and I'm not sure what number we're on. Like I said, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. But the next rule is level playing field. This is not going to be you on trial or Catholicism on trial, which is what they're wanting to do. You make them have to explain some of their stuff too, like one saved, always saved, uh, salvation through faith alone, scripture alone. Okay, And if you don't really know the arguments for that, I've got videos on YouTube and BitChute for a couple of those. I don't have um, Salvation Through Faith alone yet, but I'm planning on doing it. But again, you can always go to Catholic Answers, and they have they have all kinds of stuff on those things. So you make you turn it around. You do I'll do one and I'll answer it, but I want you to show me where it says in the Bible Scripture alone. That would be one example of how this would work, and I always go for that one Scripture alone because. The Bible does not say scripture alone, and if the Bible does not say scripture alone, then it's a self-defeating proposition. Think about it. If you're going to say all Christian beliefs must be in the Bible, and the Bible doesn't say it, then by its own test, it fails. Next rule is, where is that in the Bible? This is actually going to cover a couple of different areas. The first one is that we do not allow them to stranglehold us to scripture alone. If you're going to get into a serious debate or discussion with a Protestant on these things, then you insist on having the right to quote the early church fathers. And the reason for this is because if they know more, if you if you agree to Bible alone, if they know more of the Bible than you do, they win. If you know the same amount, then you, it's a draw. But if you know your Bible and you know the early church fathers, you win because the early church fathers confirm what Catholics believe, not what Protestants believe. Now, like I said, you always want to quote scripture because that's what they're going to respect. But they have an assumption that the early church worshipped the way they worship and believed the way they believe. And then 300 years later, Constantine came along and invented Catholicism. And then Catholicism 
drove the real church underground and all that stuff. But if you can show them by quoting early church fathers before Constantine, like Ignatius of Antioch, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, that'll show that, no, actually, the early church believed what we believed, and it's them that have the new doctrines. The second thing this is going to do is it's going to bring out that they actually don't know their Bible. They have a few verses that memorized, but here's the dirty little secret. Nobody reads the Bible. Everyone lets somebody else tell them what the Bible says. It's a big book. It's kind of dry to read and all that. And the vast majority, even these Bible-carrying Christians, only know a few scriptures. So a lot of times what I'll do when they start asking me, well, where's that in the Bible? And if it's not something that I can give a really good, you know, huge quote with, like the Immaculate Conception, without doing a lot of building with several different ones, I'll say 2 Thessalonians 2.15. And they'll say, what? And I'll say 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Read it. And they'll read it. And what it says is, hold fast to the traditions that we that have been handed down from us, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And then I'll say, see, not everything's in the Bible. And then this will stun them because they've never heard of that scripture. I guarantee you, they have never been told about that scripture. They don't know it's there. Which brings out another point. When you quote scripture, you use the Catholic terms. Okay? So Second Thessalonians 2.15, a Protestant translation might say teachings instead of traditions. Okay, they'll they'll where where the word tradition is used and they like it, they'll change it to teaching. But when it's condemned, they'll they'll keep traditions there. So when you're quoting Second Thessalonians two fifteen, you say traditions, or whenever you're quoting First um, Timothy about bishops, you say bishops, not overseers. You see, when they came out with the Protestant Bibles, they went through and they changed all these Catholic words like tradition and bishop to different words that softened them because they sounded too Catholic. Like tradition became teaching, uh, bishop, uh, bishop became overseer. And when you do that, a lot of times they'll say, well, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says overseer doesn't say bishop. And then you say, yeah, that's because your guys went through and changed it. The original word used was episcopate, which means bishop. And don't allow them to misquote scripture. If they give you a scripture passage and say, it says this, look it up. I'll give you an example. Typically, when it comes to scripture alone, 2 Timothy 3.16 is what Protestants always quote. Now, it says all scripture is inspired or God-breathed by God and profitable or usable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But they may say, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God breathed and makes the man thoroughly equipped. So therefore you don't need anything else. Well, it makes him thoroughly equipped for every good work, not doctrine. Or some of the Protestant translations, instead of saying teaching, will say doctrine. Well, it doesn't actually say that the word is teaching. And so you want to point that out. If their Bible says it is useful for doctrine instead of teaching, you want to point out to them that that's not correct. That the, the right word is either profitable or useful and that their Bible actually is not correct. Tim Staples calls this tactic of misquoting the Bible twisted scripture. So in other words, if we twist it just enough, it'll say what we want. Now, some people do it on purpose. Some people don't. But either way, you want to hold them accountable to it. Okay, and so the next rule is you invoke the rules for who has the burden of proof. They are going to try to shift the burden of proof away from them and put it onto you all the time. There are clear rules for who has the burden of proof. And it goes like this. If you make a statement that's positive or you make an accusation, you have the burden of proof. So here's an example. Let's say somebody says, the Bible says heaven helps those who help themselves. And I say, no, it doesn't. The burden of proof is on them to show where in the Bible it says it. It's not on me to show that it doesn't because then I'd have to read the entire Bible out loud and that's not reasonable. So this is going to manifest itself in this way. They're going to say, well, the, the Catholic Church did this and this date or something like that. They have the burden of proof. They need to show where that comes from. Because if I say, no, they didn't, we'll look it up. No, that's not how this works. If you make an accusation, then the burden of proof is on you to prove it, not on me to show that it's not true. Otherwise, they're going to have you chasing after every anti-Catholic accusation. And I used to do that. And I'd spend all this time looking it up, looking into it, looking at this. And then without fail, 
it was always either not true or a misrepresentation of the truth. So now I just make them show me where they're getting that information, which brings me to my next topic. Consider the source. Do not accept Protestant sources concerning Catholicism. This is the Catholic Church. We're not hiding anything. Everything is researchable. I only accept Catholic sources or a mainstream historical source. I will not accept my pastor said or a Jack T. Chick track or a book written by this Christian son he knows or or even a, anything claimed by an ex nun or an ex priest because quite frankly I don't know that that person was actually a priest or a nun because when I do read those accounts they start making accusations and saying things that I know is not true and even if it is true if this person who wrote this book or is making this claim truly is an ex priest or an ex nun why do priests and nuns leave the Catholic Church because they want to get married and break their vows but they won't say that and so what they do is they adopt all the anti-catholic stuff not only that their personal experience with the catholic church is irrelevant if you have someone who claims to have been a nun and they were in a convent and they were actually worshiping mary well that happened it actually has happened a couple of times but when it's found out they are excommunicated and kicked out of the church because the church says we are not to worship mary so their personal experience is not representative of Catholicism as a whole. And just like there are books or videos by ex-Catholics saying this is what's wrong with the Catholic Church, there are books and videos of ex-Protestants from every denomination saying how they found that Catholicism was the truth and that Protestantism was wrong. So going back to another rule where you have the level playing field, if they're going to give you a book, then you give them a book and say, here, here's your book. I would suggest Scott Hahn's uh, home Sweet Rome or Rome Sweet Home. I'm not sure which one it is. But yeah, again, make it a level playing field. If they're going to give you this book, say, I'll read it, but you need to read this. Next rule, own the bad stuff. The Catholic Church has been around for 2,000 years. It's worldwide. There have been a lot of people who are Catholics who have done bad things, including popes. Now, their point to bring this up to you is, see, these popes did these bad things or these people did these bad things, so therefore it cannot have this authority. Well, that's Donatism. And see my uh, video entitled, what, uh, what About Bad Catholics? And you, I go in there and explain that that has nothing to do with it. The Catholic Church is the truth because of the office of the papacy and the bishop, not because of the holiness of the man. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, if one part of the body hurts, the whole body suffers. So when one person does something bad, it affects everyone. And this is evident in nowhere more than in the Catholic Church, because you're going to have to explain why the Catholic Church sacked Constantinople a thousand years ago, or the Inquisitions, or any of these other things, whereas Protestantism has a tendency to break away whenever a scandal happens. If you have a church or something, there's a scandal, it breaks away, and then there's a new church, and we don't have that scandal. You can't pin that scandal on us. I call this the, uh, the Protestant retreat. When it's the good stuff, we're all one big happy Protestant family, but whenever anything bad is pointed out, well, that's not us. I'm not this or I'm not that. My church is this. So in other words, if you go to, uh, during around Thanksgiving, you go to any Protestant church and they're going to talk about in America how it was their people, the pilgrims who came over here. Yep, those are our people. They'll talk about it. But the minute you point out that those same exact people not only burned witches at the stake, but anyone who disagreed with them theologically, like Anabaptists or Quakers, then all of a sudden, well, I'm not, I'm not a Puritan. That wasn't me. I'm this, I'm that. That wasn't us. I've always found that the fact that I have to explain what Catholics did centuries ago in, an, in a land far, far away, proof that it is the real church because of what Paul said. You know, they don't have that. They keep re reinventing themselves. And by the way, the Catholic Church did not sack uh, Constantinople. It was Catholics who did it in spite of what the Pope said. The Pope told them not to go, just to, just to clarify that. Okay, so that's pretty much the rules that I have when... Protestants come up to me and start challenging me with my faith. And, you know, you really just got to start invoking this and they'll pretty much leave you alone. So the minute you say, where does it say in the Bible, Scripture alone, or you give 2 Thessalonians 2.15, or you quote an early church father, that's probably going to be the end of it. Because they're not looking for someone who knows their faith and to get into dialogue. What they're looking for is the easy kill. They're looking for someone who doesn't know their their Catholic faith, so they can bring them over into their church. And so I have a couple of other rules. One is don't go to Protestant services. 
Now, if they invite you to your church, then you invoke the uh, the the rule that says that we're going to have a level playing field. Say, sure, I'll go to your church, but you come to my church too. And if they won't, then you don't go to theirs. But you shouldn't be going there anyway, unless you have a good reason. Uh, for one, if you have family members that are Protestant and you're going to have a wedding or a funeral or something like that, and I know there's a lot of Catholics who would disagree with me on this, but I think that's okay then. I personally am married to a Protestant. She's not anti-Catholic at all. Um, we go to her church infrequently. We go to my church most of the time. We go to her church once a month for potluck because she's a Protestant and that's Protestants love potluck. Um, but if you do go to a Protestant church, you don't take their communion and you, you, you really don't participate a whole lot. You're there more as an observer. And again, I would say don't even go unless there's a good reason to do that. Also, do not give money to Protestant missionaries. Okay. Protestant missionaries, if you'll notice where they go to, they go to South America, Poland, the Philippines, heavily Catholic areas. And they're not going there to dig wells and build schools and hospitals like our missionaries do. So that's what you're thinking. They're going there to take care of their material needs. But that's not true necessarily. I don't want to make a blanket statement, but for the most part, that's not true. They're going there to give their version of the gospel. To them, a convert is, is anyone who does not have their version of the gospel. Okay. Also, if you do go to a Protestant service for whatever reason, that does not excuse you from going to Mass. You still have to go to Mass. So the few times that we do go to my wife's church, I go to another Mass. Okay, so back to the Protestant missionaries. Now, if you have a friend or a family member who is personally going on one of these missions and you want to give them 20, 50, 100 bucks, whatever, I think that's okay. You know, if you just don't want them to starve, right? But, you know, if someone comes up to you or you get someone coming to your door and they're saying, well, my, our church is going to the Philippines for a missionary. Don't give them any money because they're going there to take Catholics out of the Catholic church. They'll say that we're giving them the gospel, but, but we're, what's really happening is they are de-evangelizing Catholics. So just don't do it. Okay, a couple of quick war stories and then, we, then we'll be done. And I'm not giving you these examples to say, oh, look at me, look how good I am. Trust me, I went through years of having my butt handed to me and having to go look things up. And, and I've developed all of this through the School of Hard Knocks, through just trial and error. Now today, I have everything accessible to me. I've got several quotes from the early church fathers and scriptural passages. I went through the, the New Testament and took notes and all this stuff. So, But my son has a friend who is in Texas, and he's an Assemblies of God person. And this friend was coming to visit one weekend and they're always going back and forth over you know catholicism or whatever he, he was really anti-catholic and he told my de my son he wanted to sit down with me and talk to me about the catholic church because he knew that i was you know very much a catholic and he said he wants me to explain you know this and this and this and this and this you know he did the he did the drive-by and i said no we're not doing that he can pick I'll, in fact at that point i said i'll give him two he can pick two then I can do the research on so I can speak intelligently on it. But this is not going to be just me uh, on trial or anything like that. He's going to have to show me where it says in the Bible, Bible alone. Well, when the time came, he sat down. He goes, look, I, didn't, I don't want to get into kind of argument. I just I just want to know where, where does it say purgatory in the Bible? And I said this. He goes, okay, well, no, we're all good. We're all good. We're all good. All of a sudden, he just backed off. So that, that's what I'm saying. When they know you know what you're talking about, they're going to back off. The second one would be at my wife's church and with the pastor, which he is actually a friend of mine. But one of the, the, the kids that was there ended up going to school up around Kansas City, which was heavily Catholic. And he'd never you know, really been exposed to that. And they're telling him that the Catholic church is the original church and that all the other churches come from the Reformation. So he went to the pastor and the pastor said, no. Well, then he comes up to me and says, well, I think, yeah, I think I, I can understand how there was probably divisions. I think all the separation of the churches happened early on. And I said, no. I said, there was one church until the Reformation. Well, here comes pastor. And he gets in there and he says, well, in 1 Corinthians, it talks about divisions and factions. And I think that right there shows that the, the split happened right away. And I said, well, it doesn't say the split happened right away. It says there was disagreements, which is human. I think it's a, a huge leap to say that that means that all these other churches started earlier. Well, we went on and on, and, and somehow eventually we got to the Coptic Church because he, he's got this thing for the Coptic Church, and I asked him about that, and he said, well, they're the only church that can, um, that can legitimately 
trace themselves back to the early church and to the apostles. And I said, well, we can too. Catholic Church can too. We have a list of every pope from Peter until Francis. He goes, yeah, but if you look into history, he did not have the authority he has now until after Constantine, which was the wrong thing to say to me <laughs> because I immediately gave off a couple of quotes from the early church fathers that proved that wrong. And I mean, his eyes just got real big. And then he said, uh, well, where's that? The Bible. I said, Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which you bound on earth will be bound in heaven, which you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he said, well, you know, I have a different interpretation of that. I said, yeah, I know you do, but the early church agrees with me. And he said, well, no, I, I don't think, I, th I can see where maybe some of them did, but I don't think all of them. I said, okay, where are your quotes? Where are the people, where are the quotes from the early church that agree with you? He said, well, it's real hard to sit there and write things when you're being persecuted. I said, all these people were martyrs. This is the persecuted church. He said, well, I'll do an in-depth study on this and I'll get back to you. Well, that was four years ago and he never got back to me. And I've seen him several times since then. So again, like I said, if you know what you're talking about and, you, and they can tell you know what you're talking about, it's going to turn it up. It's going to end it quickly. Just trust me. So anyway, I hope this was helpful. Um, this is just what I have found over several years of dealing with Protestants. And again, you don't have to be well-versed. Just use the first couple of rules, which is we take this, we take one thing at a time. And if you don't know, you have the right to get back to them. So you just go home, you look it up and you get back to them and say, oh, I looked into this and this is actually what this means. So till my next video, God bless.